deck. Hi, and welcome to another old steam power machine shop. This is episode number 45. Uh, and uh, in this one we're blanking out some uh, piston rings with a Morris engine from a casting. And uh, also, uh, now you younger guys don't think much about this, but uh, I have a bucket list of things that I'd like to do before I kick the bucket. And uh, I got a chance to cross off a big entry in that list here last week and uh, made a trip out to Colorado and uh, toured the uh, narrow gauge steam powered railroads out there. And it is a spectacular thing. I would give that Dave's five star rating and if you're a viewer of this channel, um, I would ask you to, if you get a chance, go out there and ride the Durango and Silverton, ride the Colmbrees and uh, uh, Toltec, and uh, we also went on the Georgetown Loop, and uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, so I'll show you about that. Thanks a lot for your support. Thanks for all the great comments. Uh, this is I try to make this kind of an open forum. If you have a question or want to answer a question, why jump right in there. This is the casting for the piston rings that I'm going to make for the Morris engine. And it's kind of a strange looking thing, but this is actually made from a pattern that uh, they had down at Cattail Foundry for uh, piston rings and it, it belonged to the Frick company that manufactured steam engines in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the idea was they just cast a big old flange on this piece of st cast iron stock so that it would be easy to chuck up or mount on a faceplate uh, so that it wouldn't be clamping and squeezing and distorting this thin cast iron while you're machining the rings out. In fact, they probably did it on a, uh, a vertical uh, boring mill and like the railroad would well and those some of those rings were two feet in diameter they would cut them out with gangs of cutters they were like parting tools in a gang that would just come in and slice them off like six at a time after they turned the inside and outside diameter at the same time with a special tool so anyway the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to mount it on a faceplate and do it in the American lathe. Now this is a faceplate. I never had one for the American lathe and I made this years ago. It's just a piece of hot rolled steel uh, that I cut out and made a bushing here that, and threaded it to fit my lathe, welded it and then machined it flat and round and instead of T-slots, it's just got some mounting holes in it. I've used it for a lot of things and it works pretty good. It's what I got, so that's what I'm using. So, the back of this is not machined, but it's pretty good, it's pretty flat. So, I'm gonna mount it on the faceplate, about like that. And I'll put a stud there, actually, <coughs> do it this way. I can clamp, put four clamps around the outside with studs and bolts and get it in the lathe and just tap it and get it to run as true as possible, averaging out the OD and the ID. And this is the old ring out of the engine and you can see there's plenty enough material to make them out of.
I turned these bolts around so that the big nuts are over on the back side if I could get in closer. The clearance is a little scary here, but it'll clear up to there. Here's a tool that I ground up to get in, to get up in close, and uh, you see the angles on it. The idea here is that you just want to cut the OD as large as possible and the inside as small as possible, and then blank these rings off uh, about a 64th over width. So it's just a, a rough blank, and then I can finish turn them one at a time in a jig. Big enough cut uh, to start with to get under the hard surface uh, of the gasket. Got kind of like a spin on it, chills when it cools and it's hard. And the tool won't last very long if you don't take a pretty good cut off to start with. gets deeper as we go along because it's getting the casting has got a taper to it this way. So we're probably gonna have to back off on the uh, cut just a little bit.
quite a bit bigger OD than what I needed, so I took a couple extra cuts off it. That's down around uh, uh, six and three eighths. Uh, change tools. This is more of a conventional grind, right hand, high speed steel. I'm going to come across the end, face it off. Pretty hard, gnarly stuff on the end. Let's see how it goes. That off some speed up. This faced off. Uh, switch over to the boring bar. That right there is probably the handiest thing that was ever invented.
Okay, uh, at this point we're going to fast forward about eight days and uh, forget about making piston rings for a minute. Uh, and just got back from a, a trip to Cal Colorado. Uh, this is something that my cousin Rusty recording uh, put together about six months ago. Had all the arrangements made and uh, also a friend of his, Brooks Colburn, went along and uh, we had a great time. Uh, we went to the uh, uh, Calm Breeze and Toltec Railroad in Colorado, uh, the Durango and Silverton, and the Georgetown Loop. And it's a good, hard day's drive between each one of these. <clears throat> Things are really spread out in Colorado. Uh, so, I never intended for this channel to be any kind of a travel log or anything like that, but I really think you'd enjoy seeing this uh, from a technical standpoint. Uh, um, the uh, Combreeze and Toltec uh, is actually owned by New Mexico and Colorado jointly. It's a state-run operation. They do a spectacular job. Uh, their locomotives are all Baldwin's. Uh, their Mikado uh, arrangement, uh, what they call outside frame. Uh, the wheels are inside the frame and the, the uh, drive rods and everything are outside the frame. It, it looks a little uh, strange when you first start looking at them, but boy, they sure do work good. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, uh, the Combreeze and Toltec is about 64 miles long. Uh, both uh, the Combreeze and Toltec and the Durango and Silverton uh, were part of the old Denver, uh, Denver and Rio Grande railroad system. Uh, and these uh, branches got abandoned or cut off. It's a very complicated history, and you, you might be interested, you can, you can look it up online. But anyway, it, it ended up with two branches, one in eastern and one in western. And uh, so uh, I'm going to show you a couple minutes of the calm breeze uh, and uh, a look at the, some of the locomotives. And uh, they, they've been uh, pretty much continuously operated since 1881. And uh, these locomotives, uh, now the Durango and Silverton has some American locomotives and the two railroads have swapped locomotives back and forth and I mean there's a lot of uh, things going on between the two but uh, this, this, here's some clips so you can just see what the railroad is about. Baldwin locomotives <clears throat> they're narrow gauge and they're built a little different in that they basically just took a, a standard gauge frame and mounted the uh, drivers inside of the frame to make it narrow gauge it worked quite well
the next day, we drove up to Durango, Colorado, to ride the uh, Durango and Silverton. And I'll tell you, for my money, that was worth the trip. It's a little different kind of operation. It, for one thing, it's privately owned, and uh, they have their own shop complex. They do all their own work, all their own restorations, uh, and they run it like a real railroad is run because they've run it continuously since 1881. It's about uh, 45 miles up the Animas River, and uh, you'll see the terrain is some of the most spectacular that America has to offer. Uh, the locomotive, uh, number 476, is an American locomotive company, Alco. It was built in 1923 and was recently shot through the Durango and Silverton uh, shops. Overall, uh, it carries 200 PSI pressure and uh, it's a little lighter than the bald ones, but it is a snotty little engine uh, you'll see from the, from the video. This is the temporary yard north of Durango. They had a washout here a couple weeks ago when they had a real heavy rain and uh, so they're having to move their starting operations uh, towards Silverton a ways. And it takes a while to fill the tender with a garden hose. We'll be loading up in about 10 minutes.
So we're here at the ancient mining town of Silverton. We got an hour and a half lunch layover. We have lunch at a restaurant. We're loading back up on the train to head 45 miles back down the river. And <clears throat> we're all sitting there exclaiming about how the engineer and the crew did such a great job handling the train and how difficult it must be and you know it's like the old days where engineers were held in very high esteem and uh, so there's a knock on the window and uh, it's the engineer and as it turns out he is an avid fan of this channel and also a machinist in the uh, in the railroad shop down in Durango when he's not driving locomotives for him. So we mentioned that we had a uh, uh, arrangements for the normal tourist shop tour and he says I can do better than that wait till I get done at about 8:30, and I'll take you through myself personally so that's what happened. Hi guys uh, we're in the uh uh, Durango and Silverton Railroad shop here and with me is uh, Mr. Joe Daly. He was the engineer on the train that we took up to Silverton this morning and he's showing us around the shop a little bit and uh, he spent a lot of time on this railroad and uh, is gracious enough to let us in here after hours and show us a few things about the shop. Appreciate it. Good to have you here. See what he was talking about if you walk over the other side here. How wide this is for uh, for an air for you know 36 inch track that uh, you know there's an extra I don't know exactly how like 10 inches of axle there before you even get to the journal. Uh, around here for the 
uh, lateral liners on the drivers and then they'll go back to the machine shop to get uh, the journal surfaces machined and then the laterals machined. These are actually the main bearings for the drive wheels on the locomotive and they have a brass bushing or part of a brass bushing that's pressed in which is very difficult to machine because it's a crescent shape. Have a, there'll be a channel milled uh, about yay long down the top of the brass and then on the forward side, so as you rotate, as the axle is rotating forward in the box, there are notches cut down here that connect with the, the channel. So as the, as the axle rotates, it picks up the green. Um, you stick a piece of boiler plate in there and you, you have to, there's dies, you can, there's interchangeable dies, and it'll flange the boiler plate to whatever shape you want it to. Uh, for if you know if you're replacing a you mean like a, a head like a, a round right flu head right that is amazing without any wrinkling or puckering on the flange and that's air powered it is big air cylinder back here We all have, you know, it kind of, kind of goes along with what you were just saying. We, uh, no matter how smart you are, it takes a while to uh, learn how to do certain aspects of this. And once you learn how to do, you know, some of the tasks that need to get done, that's kind of what you end up doing because you can do it fast, faster than anybody else. Um, uh, right before the railroad got severed because of the washout up there on the hill, it had just finished a complete, uh, it just got a, we had just finished a complete running gear job on it. Uh, drivers, tires, uh, crank pins quartered, uh, driver boxes, rod brasses, uh, all of the wear components in the running gear were rebuilt and it hasn't had a day's operation. Uh, and this one here, I just did a, uh, it, it got, it didn't get the driver's turn, but it got a new, uh, a new set of rod brasses, all the, all the rod brasses are new, and I had just, uh, had, I took all the valve gear off of it and rebushed the valve gear and made new pins. And these uh, these rods here, uh, these are called combination levers, are brand new. We had these made by a machine, a CNC machine shop in Portland, um, and uh, they're brand new. We're we're in the process of replacing all these rods. One part at a time. Well, as much as we can afford at a time. I think these are, uh, my boss told me these are something like uh, $20,000 a piece. And they come to us with, this hole is in place, and the hole here that goes through the valve crosshead is there, but it's not reamed. It's got to be reamed for a, a 16th taper, and then this hole, we, we have to drill and ream it for a 3 quarter inch taper. This machine uses a, a tracer uh, with a template for the proper profile. This, uh, the vertical bull bullard is, uh, I think it dates from the 20s, I'm not 100% sure, but we use this primarily for uh, turning the inside diameters of locomotive tires and uh, the, the wheels, the bore and the wheels for uh, coach, coach wheels and tender wheels. This basically is a reverse boring head. It, it turns the outside of the pin. Correct. To to uh, take up, uh, to machine them undersize for wear, right? 
And it also keeps the center distance correct. It ma it makes it so that they're exactly 90 degrees apart. Oh, okay. Indexed them. Right. Indexes them too. And it does both ends at the same time. Correct.